Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, you handcraft each of us uh, according to your great love and in your image and likeness. We ask you to uh, send your Spirit uh, into our hearts and minds to help us to be aware of our brothers and sisters in their need, uh, in their ability, in their talents, in their dignity uh, with which you created them. Uh, we ask you to help us to have the wisdom, the understanding, uh, to walk together uh, into your embrace and to have the courage to speak, speak out against uh, all wrongs, against justice. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, welcome to the St. Martin Before the Progress uh, Lecture Series, uh, Session 2. Uh, as David mentioned last week, uh, the purpose of the St. Martin Before Us Project is to help us as a parish see racism, uh, build racial justice, and heal through racial harmony. Uh, I want to start today by uh, giving you an opportunity to make any comments that you would like about David's presentation last week, uh, seeing racism, context, and introduction. Uh, any comments or any questions you might have. Uh, David's not here, so I might not be able to answer your question, but I will do the best I can. Um, uh, David did provide his email address, so if there's something that I can't address, you can always contact him and see uh, what he would answer to that. Uh, so first step is to open the floor and uh, to any comments or questions about last week's presentation. Well, uh, I had, you know, he said we're going to become uncomfortable about some of the statements that were made. And the statement on page 33 that says the cumulative effects of personal sin and racism have led to social structures of injustice and violence that we are all accomplices in. And, and for me, I, you know, I have a personal history and I, I know that the bishops have a personal history, but assigning that accomplices in racism is kind of a stretch. Yeah. And I, you know, you don't have time to hear my personal story, but sure. uh, I, you know, if the intent is to unify, right. then like, what the South African Truth and Reconciliation Hearings. You know, I paid attention to that when I was a young person and I am today. Sure. And there was an opportunity for people to speak their stories. And that had a great feeling. I am all for here hearing the stories of injustice that were, but there were quite a lot of white people that moved in the direction of healing even before. So it's really, I think, really 
try to address those sins of omission uh, that, uh, and, and that, that line that often comes up upon people, you know, well, I, I'm not doing anything particular to hurt people, and therefore um, it's not my responsibility. So I think that's what that line is trying to address. It does so aggressively, I agree with you. Uh, I, I personally have, have a little trouble with that idea of accomplice as well. Um, but, uh, but so far as it calls us the responsibility to act towards healing, like you said, that reconciliation idea, um, I think that's, uh, you know, I think, I think that's primarily what it's trying to do. If you look at the document as a whole, it's trying to uh, store up within us that responsibility to bring healing and to overturn some of these structures um, that hurt our brothers and sisters. So I think that, that's what I would say to that. In terms of uh, our, our population here in uh, St. Francis, um, I, I, there, it's, only, it's only a handful of families. Um, some of our families are actually African, uh, and then there's a, a handful of families that are African and American. Uh, so, uh, so there's really sort of two groups there. Um, with the Finnell Parish, but they're, they're a small percentage. I don't know the exact number of the exact percentage, but it is small. Uh, we also have a number of Asian families uh, and a number of uh, Latino families, um, but all of those are, are fairly small. We are primarily uh, an Anglo uh, parish at this point. So, um, and we're the third. Uh, how do we evangelize? And that's one of the things we'll get into. Uh, as we talk about the book uh, properly, um, you know, what are the steps we can take uh, to invite people in and share the gospel with them? So, other questions or comments from last week? Okay, let's talk about uh, this week's topic, which is uh, Open Wide Our Hearts, The Enduring Call of Love, A Pastoral Letter Against Racism. This uh, pastoral letter comes from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, Bishops uh, also known as the USCCD. So what is the USCCD? Who are they? Uh, in the Catholic Church, the Pope appoints the bishop of every Catholic diocese. Uh, the bishop is sovereign in his own diocese. He doesn't have a supervisor, so to speak. You know, uh, he, he makes, uh, according to canon law, According to the doctrines of the faith, he uh, is in charge of making decisions for his diocese. Okay. Uh, there are uh, way, reasons for and ways to remove a bishop. You know, if he uh, it, it violates canon law egregiously or uh, slips into heresy or whatever, you know, there are ways to remove a bishop. Uh, but as long as he's bishop, he basically makes the decisions within uh, his diocese. Um, he's not getting memos from the Pope every week saying, you need to do this in Birmingham, you need to do this in Talladega, you need to do this in St. Francis and Tuscaloosa. You know, uh, the bishop is in charge of his diocese. The dioceses are grouped into provinces. These are, are so for us, it's Alabama and Mississippi. Uh, so it's the Archdiocese of Mobile, the Diocese of Birmingham, the Diocese of Jackson, the Diocese of Biloxi. And uh, within that province, one of the provinces, one of the bishops is considered the first among equals, and that's our archbishop. So for us, the archbishop is in Mobile, uh, and it's Archbishop Brody for us. He's, our metro, he's considered our metropolitan. Uh, but again, he's not the supervisor of the other three bishops. The other three bishops aren't reporting to him. You know, he's, he's the first among equals. So he, he might lead us to make uh, certain decisions within the province, but he can't demand that the other bishops make uh, certain decisions. Um, so, and then within the United States, because we have so many dioceses uh, and so many bishops, we're actually grouped into regions within the diocese, within this country as well. Um, but that's just an administrative thing. There's no theological uh, significance to that one. Uh, and then above the provinces or regions are conferences. And usually these conferences go along uh, uh, political lines, so they're, they're bishops within a certain country make up a conference. Sometimes when there are uh, a smaller country with not very many Catholics or not very many bishops, 
You might have two or three or a group of countries all within one conference. But the United States, because we're so big and have so many bishops, uh, where all our bishops are in a single conference and all of them are from the United States. So the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops are all the bishops in the United States, make up our conference. And again, you know, they make decisions uh, about uh, pastoral concerns and procedures within the United States. Um, and, and, you know, basically they're more or less generally um, recommendations to the bishops. A bishop does not have to adopt uh, a, a, a policy of the United States Catholic uh, Conference of Bishops, you know, uh, within his own diocese. Uh, but they do set the direction for the pastoral care in the United States, uh, you know, particularly if there's uh, uh, social issues or uh, political issues within the United States, the, the, the conference as a whole oftentimes addresses those issues. How many bishops do we have now, or dioceses? I do not know that. Okay. Uh, it, it's it's well over 100. Uh, it might be as high as 200, but I don't know the specific number. So um, don't have to know that yet. Then. Okay. Uh, well over 100, maybe as high as 200. Uh, the USCCB uh, meets in uh, a general meeting twice a year. Uh, generally in June and um, June and November, they'll meet as a, as a committee of the whole. Um, and then it also has committees and staff that work on various pastoral concerns throughout the year. Uh, so besides these two big meetings they have, uh, they'll also, they're also active throughout the year. It's not just those two, two, two times a year uh, that they're doing things. Uh, the various bishops are on committees, they might bring in other folks, other experts in to help them on their committees, and then there's a whole staff. Uh, they actually have a website, uh, you can go on the website and see all the things that they do uh, so, uh, in terms of the pastoral care for, for, for the church in the United States. Uh, some of it's liturgical stuff, some of it's catechetical stuff, sometimes, sometimes uh, some is social justice stuff, there's a whole range of things that they deal with. Any questions about the USCCB? Okay, so that's who put out this document. Uh, this document doesn't come out of nowhere. There's a whole history of uh, documents uh, that the church, both the United States uh, bishops and uh, the uh, papacy, the, the popes, there's a whole history of, of documents that have addressed the issue of slavery, the issue of racism, uh, the issue of creation, basically, and where humans come from. Uh, so I'm, I just want to touch, I'm not going to hit everything, but I just want to give you a sense of some of the documents that are out there uh, that came before the two documents that we're talking about uh, in, in this series, the Open uh, Wide Our Hearts and the Fertility Two. Uh, from the first sin came all evils, and especially this perversity that there were men who, forgetful of the original brotherhood of the race, instead of seeking, as they should naturally have done, to promote mutual kindness and mutual respect, following their evil desires, began to think of other men as their inferiors, and hold them as cattle born for the yoke. In this way, through an absolute forgetfulness of our common nature and of human dignity and the likeness of God stamped upon us all, it came to pass that in contentions and wars, which then broke out, those who were the stronger were used to conquer into slavery, so that mankind, though of the same race, became divided into two sections, the conquered slaves and the victorious masters. That's from a papal document in Imploribus, um, which came out in 1888. Uh, one of the things I want to highlight on that is, well, a few things. One is, the church's consistent teaching about the common origin of all humans. There's a shared human nature that we have. That shared human nature comes from the fact that God created each of us and created us in his image and likeness. That's true of everybody. Um, and uh, because of that, because God created all each of us and we have that common human nature, there's a dignity, a human dignity that each of us has. That really is the core teaching 
of everything the church teaches about slavery and racism. And we see it, we'll see it come up again and again in every document. And it really sort of refutes uh, the core ideas of racism, that some certain races which in, within the human race are superior to others, um, or that there are, uh, there, there's, oh, there, it's not so common anymore, but uh, there was a time when there was a thought that you know, the different races came from different species even, you know, uh, that there wasn't one human species that all the races were part of. Um, so the, the church, the, the, that idea that's common origin uh, from God with a common nature and a common human dignity is really the core of the church's teaching on slavery and racism. So all the way back in 1435, in a table document called Sikum Dudu, uh, we see the church condemning enslavement of the Canary Islanders. So this is really the beginning when the European powers are first going out and discovering the world, uh, quote unquote. Uh, they get to the Canary Islands uh, off of, uh, is that off Africa, I believe? Somewhere right there in the, in the eastern Atlantic. Um, and the church is standing against that first colonization, enslavement of the peoples during that first colonization. Uh, it's renewed in 1537, Sub Lumus Deus, also a papal document, asserting the rationality of Native Americans. So by this time, colonization has occurred in the Americas. Uh, uh, so um, the papal document asserts that uh, the Native Americans are rational beings. They are humans. Um, they condemn the treatment of Native Americans as animals, and they condemn the slave slavery in that document, that particularly dealing with the situation in the Americas. In Sobrego Apostolatus, uh, in 1839, uh, we see another condemnation of enslavement, enslavement and a uh, summary of earlier papal condemnation, condemnation, condemnations of slavery. You know, all through that period where slavery, slavery was rampant, rampant Due to European colonization, the, uh, the uh, papal there were papal documents coming out again and again condemning enslavement. So this document in the 1830s uh, reiterates all that history of condemnation of enslavement. And then in Florus, um, in 1888, uh, which was quoted from earlier, uh, <coughs> this is really sort of. Um, one of the last documents on slavery because after this slavery uh, as a state sponsored reality uh, starts going away, basically goes away after this period. Um, we see uh, the papal statement on an abolition of slavery in Brazil. Um, we also see the church condemning uh, different aspects, different uh, theories on race. In uh, Meet Renender Sorge uh, in 1937, it condemns Nazi Nazism and specifically Nazi racial theory. Um, it rejects that whole idea of an Aryan nation. In Romani Generis in uh, 1950, it talks about human origins, uh, again, part of that long standing Catholic insistence on the unity of the human species against the polygenesis theories of multiple origins of humanity. Of humanity. You know, so even you know, mid of the mid last century, there are still people sort of embracing that idea that there were multiple uh, origins to the different uh, races. The church stood against that. We also see in the early 20th century a lot of Catholic opposition to eugenics, which isn't specifically about race, but it is. Uh, at least in part. So eugenics was basically the idea that there are certain people that shouldn't be allowed to breed, you know, and that poverty comes from the wrong people breeding. Uh, that was a, a rampant idea uh, throughout the 1800s in the United States into the uh, early 1900s, and the church again and again came, again came out against this idea that there are certain people that shouldn't be allowed to breed. Uh, focusing primarily on poverty, but of course poverty also bleeds into race in, in, in the United States oftentimes. Uh, we also see, even though these documents aren't specifically about racism, uh, 
uh, we do see uh, various documents uh, uh, mentioning racism and uh, uh, condemning racism. So uh, Paul VI, Patrick Terrace in 1963, Gaudium Espes, uh, space in 1965 from the Second Vatican Council and Populorum Progresso in 1967, which I believe would also be a Pope the Sixth document. Um, we do have some specific documents uh, before these documents that we're talking about now, uh, specifically about against racism. In uh, 1977, uh, might be 1979, I saw two dates for this one. Uh, Brothers and Sisters to, Ed, to Us uh, was the last document before the document we're dealing with today from the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops, specifically against racism. Um, and then uh, in 2001, uh, the Church and Racism was, came out of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, um, and I believe that was also an updated version of a previous document, uh, but that was sort of the last main statement that uh, that Rome made about uh, racism before uh, this current document uh, for Jelly Chewy that Francis came out with. So I just want to give you a sense that, you know, there's a whole history, a document, a documental history uh, that goes before the two documents that we're talking about today. This isn't some new teaching that we're coming up with, but it's an, it's an old teaching, an ancient teaching even, that is to be applied specifically to our current situation, both in the United States and in the world. Any questions about the, the documents? Okay. So, Open Wide Our Hearts uh, comes, uh, was, um, was assigned to, um, by the bishops to the Committee on Cultural Diversity. So uh, there's one of the committees of the conference was, uh, was given the task of coming up with a statement for the bishops uh, on racism and the current situation. <coughs> the document that they came up with uh, was approved uh, by the conference as a whole in their November 2018 general meeting. And so, the document begins with the question of what is racism? Catholic race theory, in quotes. Uh, we can sort of talk about that. You know, what does the church say as opposed to these other theories about uh, some races being inferior or even being of different origin? Again, this is what we saw in the quote. <coughs> this is what this document reiterates. From the Catholic point of view, humans have a common origin. There aren't multiple origins for humanity. There's one common origin. All people are equally made, each person is equally made in the image of God. And because of that, we are all brothers and sisters. It is us, not us and them. Okay? That's the basic uh, Catholic understanding of race. Uh, and human origins. Against that, we see um, this idea of racism. Uh, and the basic idea of racism is that one owns race or ethnicity is superior. And therefore, other races or ethnicities are inferior or, un or unworthy of equal regard. That's the basic concept of racism that we have this idea in our mind that my race is superior to your race, and your race is therefore inferior, unworthy of the same regard as my race. Uh, when that idea gets transformed into acts, what you have are racist acts, uh, <coughs> that favors one uh, race because of their superiority over other races because they are inferior or that's where you slip into sin, and that's where you get injustice. Racism, racist acts violate justice because they violate that uh, common dignity that we all have, okay? that common origin that we all have. It's a failure of 
to acknowledge human the human dignity of the other. It is marked by things like exclusion. Some people are allowed in, other people aren't because of their race. Uh, ridicule, mistreatment, unjust discrimination, failure to love. That's really the form of it. It's a failure to love the other as an image and likeness of God. Um, and it can be conscious or unconscious. You know, uh, there are overt acts of racism. There are also oftentimes hindering acts of racism. That we do things that are, are racist without even realizing it. Actually, let me go back to the previous slide in the slide a second. Any questions about that previous uh, slide and where racism sort of comes out of it and that definition of racism that the document provides? Uh, so the forms of racism, racism comes in many ways. Uh, sometimes it comments, jokes, disparaging looks. Uh, sometimes it's, it's more overt, such as symbols as nuisance and swastikas. Uh, it can be discrimination in hiring, housing, education opportunities, incarceration. <coughs> One of the things that we see in our country right now is a great disparity, disparity uh, sorry, uh, a great difference in terms of um, uh, people who are incarcerated, and uh, what happens when somebody is um, uh, accused of, particularly of a nonviolent drug crime? Uh, we, the, the, we, what the statistics show that uh, the use of illegal drugs is fairly consistent across the races, whether you're Latino, whether you're white, whether you're black. You know, the number of people who use illegal drugs is fairly consistent. Uh, but the number of people who get put in jail for using illegal drugs in a nonviolent uh, act, <coughs> the number, the percentage of blacks who go to jail uh, for something like that compared to the number of whites, there's a great difference in that. You know, that that's really can't be explained except that our institutions somehow are set up in a racist manner that favors blacks going to jail and whites not going to jail. Bail money. <coughs> bail money. Bail part of it, yeah. Uh, but that's only, bail's only a piece of it, right? Um, racial pro profiling is also a different, uh, uh, another form of racism. Uh, sin of, sins of omission, being silenced in the face of uh, racist acts by others. Um, or uh, encountering racist institutions. Um, <coughs> sometimes racism is generational. It gets passed down from family to family. You know, so things that you, we grow up with that we don't even think of as racist because it was always there in our family life. You know, uh, we didn't make a conscious decision that you know, oh, I'm going to say this racist thing, or I'm going to do this racist thing, or I'm going to think this racist way. But you know, it's just like the other things that we learn in our families. It was always around us, and so we adapt, adopt, adopt it uh, without even thinking about it and how it affects racism. Uh, sometimes it's cultural, again, more broadly than just our family. Oftentimes within our culture, there are, there are cultural ideas. I was listening to a, a podcast, um, no, it's probably been a few months ago and now, um, and they were doing clips of a roast of Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, they, you know, in the, in the early 70s, they would do these roasts of various peoples all, all the time. And you know, the things that the jokes that were coming out at Sammy Davis Jr.'s uh, uh, roast, you know, celebrity roast, I mean, it was just appalling. Appalling what, they, what these folks, these sort of normal, everyday, even avant-garde Hollywood types, you know, in the early 70s, were saying openly on national television, <laughs> To, with Sammy Davis Jr. standing like sitting right there in front of you, right? just laugh. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and and you respected the laugh, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so sometimes it's just the cultural things uh, that it gets moved into, and then sometimes, as I mentioned, it's institution uh, things. Even even sometimes things that are meant to benefit uh, people get institutionalized in a way um, because because we don't bother to listen to the story people were trying to help. You know, this doesn't just happen in terms of racism, it happens in terms of poverty all the time. Um, but
that the, you know, people we're supposedly trying to help don't actually get help because we don't bother to listen to their story. Or sometimes, you know, somebody with a, you know, uh, with an agenda uh, gets in a certain position and are able to uh, pass laws uh, that end up being uh, racially de detrimental. Uh, you know, um, and, and so the, uh, that racism gets institutionalized. You know, uh, one of the things that has been uh, devastating, you know, is you know this whole notion of three strikes and you're out. You know, that was you know supposedly to, to be anti-crime, to be tough on the crime. Well, you know, um, those laws tend to give so much discretion to um, the prosecutors uh, that uh, you know if you didn't have a, a, a discriminate prosecutor. Uh, they would end up, um, you know, you know, uh, using that possibility of this three three strikes and you're out to get pleas from people because the risk of you know going to jail forever was so high that it was safer to plead even if you weren't guilty than risk you know uh, being convicted and ending up in jail for for life. Uh, so some of these laws that, that, that were sort of meant to you know, protect us in a certain sense have a devastating effect in actual practice. Yeah. So that's where we see some of the institutional aspects of, of racism get baked in. Any questions about these sort of different forms of racism that the document uh, brings out? Uh, they also mentioned some uh, difficult areas that it's hard to figure out exactly what's the right uh, balance is. Uh, one is the interaction with police. Uh, sometimes uh, certain uh, races, because of the history uh, between uh, police in certain neighborhoods and, and, and areas, uh, you know, there's a difficult interaction between uh, you know certain communities and uh, certain police. Uh, and you know the, the bishops really didn't get a good answer on, on how to do that. You know how to how to solve that that tension. Uh, but it did highlight on the one hand that you know you know we want to respect the police and you know we don't want violence against the police. You know and yet the police have sometimes overstepped their boundaries. So how do we how do we get that balance right so that you know the uh, communities that uh, the police are supposed to be protecting. Uh, feel that they're being protected and that there's a good relationship there between police and communities and there isn't this tension about, oh no, what are we going to do? You know, what's going to happen? Um, there is uh, the fact of segregation where you know, sometimes there isn't segregation because of policy or because of the law, you know, but in reality there is de facto. You know, we have it here in, in Tuscaloosa. You know, uh, you go north of the river, you know, and it's primarily white. You go west of uh, Lillian Wallace, and it's primarily black. You know, there's no wall making that happen, but you know it's there, easy to see. You know, so how do you overcome this de facto segregation that goes on uh, so often in our society? Um, allocation of resources. The bishops, in particular, mention. Uh, the incident in uh, uh, Flint, um, in Flint, Michigan. You know, why aren't the resources in place to keep that disaster from happening? Um, the persistence of racism. Racism comes back again and again. You know, we got rid of slavery, and then there was Jim Crow. We got rid of Jim Crow, and then there's mass incarceration. You know, uh, racism just seems there's a persistence in, relate, in, in racism in this society. Uh, in our country, in the history of our country, um, that that makes it very difficult to completely overcome it and allow for healing and allow for that racial harmony that we ultimately would like to see. And the bishops say, uh, you know, an important line <coughs> line here uh, is people are still being harmed, so action is still needed. <coughs> so even if you know, 90% of the people, 99% of the people were on board. You know, um, even if, even with that, if there was 1% that was still harming people on a racist basis, there would still be need for action. 
That's the key. You know, people are being harmed, and therefore um, action is still needed. Any questions about these? Um, so at the end of their introduction about what is racism, uh, the bishops turn to uh, Micah 6 to 8, 8 as, as the basis uh, for going forward and figuring out what do we need to do. So they start by saying, you know, this is the issue, racism, and this is what racism looks like. Uh, so how are we going to move forward? And so they give us Micah 6, 8. You have been told, O mortal, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, only to do justice and to love goodness and to walk humbly with your God. And so the rest of the document goes through those three steps and uh, thinks about, you know, what do we need to do in terms of doing justice, what do we need to do in terms of loving goodness, and what do we need to do in terms of walking humbly with your God. So next week we'll pick up on, on that and we'll go through the rest of the document following that schema that the bishops lay out. Any questions? Any thoughts? Any comments? You know what I liked last week that I forgot with everything he said was about, the, you know, the Confederate statues mm -hmm. and um, how, you, you know, people are like, I, they need to go up because that's our history. And what's the answer to that? You know? He said something that was good, but I forget. Um, I forget what he said, too. Uh huh. Um, um, something about why do, we, why do those people need those statues up? You know, people that really want them up, why do you yeah. want them up? Yeah. And, and part of it is what you, you know, in, at least in terms of some of the statues, is the history of that particular statue and uh, why, why it was put up in the first place. Uh, oftentimes these statues were put up, um, they, you know, they weren't put up during the Civil War or right after the Civil War. You know, they were put up in, you know, the, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes specifically as a rallying point to keep Jim Crow in place and keep, you know, uh, racial um, separation in place. You know, so oftentimes these statues that are, you know, part of, you know, you know celebrating our history were specifically put up for racist reasons, you know, as a rallying point. You know, like I said, not always the case, but oftentimes that was the case. Um, but I don't, re I, I know, I do remember David saying something about that, but I don't remember exactly what it was. But it's still up there, so you can go back and look at it <laughs> and see what he's going to look at um, So, um, yeah, so, but I think part of it was, you know, what history are we remembering, you know, with these statues? You know, um, are, are we remembering the, the all of what they did or just a piece? You know, are, they, are we glorifying just that piece and ignoring the atrocities that oftentimes some of these folks are Get in sort of the, the meat of the document next week.